Though it goes unmentioned in America's government-issue school textbooks, documents and recordings have been declassified and released through Freedom of Information Act requests, proving that America's entry into World War II was another calculated event and not the result of a surprise Japanese attack. A 1940 Gallup poll showed 83% of the public was against intervention. A good pretext was needed to gain support from an intransigent public. 32nd President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a 33rd degree Mason, committee of 300 member, grandson of an opium smuggler, and nephew of Frederick Delano, an original Federal Reserve boardman. FDR stayed in office for 12 years, 1933 to 1945, choosing skull and bonesman Henry Stimson as Secretary of War for the last five years. Henry Stimson was also Secretary of War to his brother bonesman, President Taft, from 1911 to 1913, during the build-up to World War I. With the aid of fellow Mason and Committee of 300 member, Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, these three secret society elites would help lead us into World War II. David Icke wrote, Roosevelt, an Illuminati bloodline wholly owned by the Council on Foreign Relations, set about provoking Japan into an attack with a number of measures, including the targeting of Japanese oil supplies. As a congressional investigation heard in 1945, the messages indicating a decision to go to war with the United States and Britain, though not with Russia, were intercepted and decoded on December 3, 1941 four days before Pearl Harbor. These messages subsequently went missing from Navy files. Other decoded messages gave Roosevelt prior warning of the attack, but the public were not told, and nor were the sitting targets in Hawaii. In all, Roosevelt had information from eight different sources indicating a probable attack. The historian Robert Stinnett revealed the results of 17 years of research into the Pearl Harbor conspiracy in his book, Day of Deceit, The Truth About FDR and Pearl Harbor. His research included more than a million documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, which show that knowledge of the Japanese plans was kept from commanders in Hawaii, the very same men who were later made scapegoats for what happened. One very early warning came almost a full year before the attack, on January 27, 1941. Joseph Grew, the U.S. ambassador to Tokyo, wrote a letter to Roosevelt stating specifically that in the event of war, Pearl Harbor would be Japan's first target. Months later, on July 22, 1941, a report by Admiral Richmond Turner read, quote, It is generally believed that shutting off the American supply of petroleum will lead promptly to the invasion of Netherlands East Indies. It seems certain that she, Japan, would also include military action in the Philippine Islands, which would immediately involve us in a Pacific War. This is precisely what would happen. Alex Jones wrote, Months before the attack, they knew the Japanese were preparing for an all-out assault in the Pacific. The History Channel and many historical records have reported that 12 days prior to the attack, Roosevelt knew the actual date of the strike. The government had in its possession Admiral Yamamoto's communique reading, quote, On the morning of December 7, we will attack the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor and deal a death blow. Two weeks before the Pearl Harbor attack, on November 25, 1941, after a conversation with Secretary of War Henry Stimson, Roosevelt wrote in his diary, quote, The question was how we should maneuver them into the position of firing the first shot without too much danger to ourselves. It was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt in anyone's mind as to who were the aggressors. On November 26th, the day after Roosevelt's diary entry, he received a very suspicious phone call from Winston Churchill. A large Japanese fleet, including six aircraft carriers, had recently gone missing, and Churchill said to Roosevelt in the recording, quote, I can assure you that their goal is the cuts out, fleet in Hawaii, at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt goes on to ask, quote, The obvious implication 
is that the Japs are going to do a Port Arthur on us at Pearl Harbor. Do you concur? Churchill says he does indeed, and Roosevelt adds, quote, I will have to consider the entire problem, a Japanese attack on us, which would result in war between, and certainly you as well, would certainly fulfill two of the most important requirements of our policy. Exactly what requirements, and what policy Roosevelt was referring to, is unknown. But one thinks back to fellow 33rd degree Mason Albert Pike's 1871 letter to Mazzini about fomenting three world wars. It was also Churchill's fellow Committee of 300 member, and Mason H.G. Wells, who predicted, in his 1933 book, the shape of things to come, that a second world war would start around 1940, originating from a German-Polish dispute. Were Albert Pike, H.G. Wells, and other Masons prophetic in their visions of the future, or were they knowingly, actively, working towards a long-planned objective? Jim Mars wrote, As hard to believe as it may be for Americans brought up on wartime propaganda films and publications devoted merely to war technology and battles, World War II was largely the result of infighting between secret occult societies composed of wealthy businessmen that eventually led to international tensions that provoked open warfare. As in other conflicts, the manipulation and influence of these societies is found in the origins and finances of the war, not on the battlefields. Abundant evidence now exists indicating that World War II was brought about by agents and members of secret societies connected to the Illuminati and Freemasonry in both Germany and Britain. The day after the Roosevelt-Churchill phone call, on November 27, 1941, news of the Japanese fleet's probable approach on Pearl Harbor reached CFR-connected U.S. Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall. On the same day, he sent a message to Hawaiian commanders stating, quote, Hostile action possible at any moment. If hostilities cannot, repeat cannot be avoided, the United States desires that Japan commit the first overt act. This policy should not, repeat not, be construed as restricting you to a course of action that might jeopardize your defense. The Honolulu Advertiser front page headline on November 30th, 1941 read, Japan may strike over weekend. Still, the military was told to go to the lowest level of readiness, the ships in the harbor were lined up in tight rows, and the aircraft on the airfields were put into circles, nose tip to nose tip. During the week before the attack, the U.S. intercepted a code purple message sent to the Japanese embassy in Washington ordering them to destroy all classified documents and prepare to evacuate the country. On December 4th, Australian intelligence reported to Roosevelt that the missing Japanese fleet was indeed moving toward Pearl Harbor. That same day, Roosevelt specifically ordered the Pacific fleet moved into a compact and exposed formation of snug rows. Pearl Harbor Admiral James Richardson repeatedly objected to such strategic suicide and was actually replaced for refusing to position the fleet as ordered. Not only was the Pearl Harbor fleet intentionally lined up nose-tip to nose-tip for Japan's carpet-bombing convenience, but all the brand new U.S. ships and aircraft were moved away, leaving only the older ships to be sacrificed. Jim Mars wrote, According to author John Tolland, separate warnings regarding a pending attack on Pearl Harbor, though varying as to a specific time, came from U.S. Ambassador to Japan Joseph Crew. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, Senator Guy Gallet, Congressman Martin Dees, Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe in Java, and Colonel F. G. I. Weigerman, the Dutch military attaché in Washington. Later, Dutch naval officer Captain Johan Ranet said sources in U.S. intelligence told him on December 6th that the Japanese carriers were only 400 miles northwest of Hawaii. During investigations after the attack, Marshal and Navy Secretary Frank Knox both testified that they could not recall their whereabouts the night of December 6th. It was later revealed that they were both in the White House with Roosevelt. Four years later, another 33rd-degree Mason, Harry Truman, 
still under the direction of Bonesman Secretary of War Henry Stimson, dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, ending World War II. In fact, Japan was waving their white flag and had already surrendered to the U.S.'s terms and conditions before the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But in order to make an example out of Japan, and to show the world U.S. weaponry and military dominance, Truman did not honor the surrender until after the bombs were dropped. David Icke wrote, This is the background to Harry S. Truman, the Freemason placeman who refused to accept Japan's terms of surrender, ordered the atomic devastation, and then accepted the surrender on the same terms he had refused before. The bombs were dropped because as one phase ended, another was immediately begun, the Cold War. And it is so much easier to engender the fear necessary for that if people have seen for themselves what happens when one of these devices explodes. After the war, the world was mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically devastated. This allowed the banks to make vast fortunes lending money to governments to rebuild the societies destroyed by a war the same banks had funded. This massively increased the debt owed by nations to private banks, and the control over those countries increased in proportion. The desperation for peace made the world open to the main reason the Brotherhood had created the war, the formation of the United Nations. Problem, reaction, solution. The charter for the United Nations, the worldwide body the Brotherhood so badly wanted, was written by a committee of the Council on Foreign Relations. Texmars wrote, The best of historians now admit, for example, that President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his corrupt Masonic associates knew in advance of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor that catapulted the United States into war. The Illuminati wanted world war, and the American airmen, soldiers, and sailors who died on December 7, 1941 were considered necessary to precipitate the USA's entrance into World War II. The U.S. government also had prior knowledge of both the 1993 Oklahoma City bombing of the Murrah Federal Building and the 9-11 bombing attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. The massive loss of life was no obstacle as far as the elite were concerned. Their cold-blooded agenda is calculated to engender chaos and destruction in a never-ending alchemical process of bringing ordo ab chao, order out of chaos. To the elite, murder is business as usual.